This is Damian Macy. I'm from the Marshall Oral History Project, Friends of the Library, and I'm at the home of Barb Gagan on North Route 1, just north of Marshall, in her lovely home, sitting in her kitchen, and we're going to interview her today, and we'll find out a little bit about her past history and what she likes. And with that, I'll introduce you to Miss Barb. Okay, I'm Barbara Gagan. Um, I've lived here in Marshall all of my life. My, uh, I was born here, and all my brothers and sisters were born here. My father is from here. My mother was from Paris. Okay. Did uh, you live in town or out in the country? Or we lived uh, mostly in town. It was considered, now it would be considered a little outside of town, but when I was growing up, it was town. Okay. Did, uh, did you go to school in Marshall then? I went to school here in Marshall. All my uh, 12 years, I went to uh, grade school at the South School and then the North School. I mean, I didn't go to North School. I did go North, but it was to the high school, where it is still now. Still the high school there was changed some, um, renovated, and, and uh, that's about all I can tell you. What was your neighborhood like, or how do, would you describe the area that you lived in? Uh, we had a pretty busy neighborhood. All the neighbors were friendly. Uh, we had, uh, uh, there was a lot of kids in our neighborhood. Mostly, there was more boys than there were girls. Girls didn't get out and do like they do now. We stayed pretty close to home and helped your mother because. Uh, I'll bet you had some chores that around the house that you had to do. We right? had a lot of chores we had to do, uh, especially we used to uh, curtains in the spring. We used to put them out on the. Uh, they were strung up on curtain stretchers, what they call curtain stretchers, and. Um, it had some sharp nails in them, too, that you could get under a fingernail and were not very comfortable when you prick mm -hmm. one of those. And then we had a washing machine. We didn't have, of course, you didn't have dryers in. You hung your clothes out on the line. And my clo on our clothes were, in the wintertime, were hung in the house, which was aggravating because it was, you had to dodge clothes because of the lines through the, mostly dining room. They weren't ever hung in the living room. Dining room and kitchen, mostly in the dining room. And that big stove in the corner is what helped them. That big stove in the, in the living room, and there was a stove in the kitchen, and there's reservoir oil in the stove in the kitchen. And um, kind of explain what that is and what it's for, because none younger people would not uh, even know. A reservoir that oil meant. was just like a little. It was just a container that was come along with the stove. Uh, and that's where it held your hot water that you could wash dishes with or anything you need hot water. And then you had, <coughs> excuse me, you had a, um, re well, you had a refrigerator, but a refrigerator wasn't like the refrigerators now. You got ice. Ice was delivered sometimes in the summertime twice a week. Usually it was delivered on, on a two, Monday or Tuesday and then delivered on a Saturday so you'd have for the weekend. You'd have ice for the weekend. As I recall, the gentleman that delivered the ice knew what to deliver by a card that you'd put in the you window. you put a right? card in the window or a card on the house. Uh, usually it was delivered 25 to 50 pounds. And then um, the kids' jobs was to empty the water. When the ice would melt, there would be a pan in the refrigerator that collected the water, and then you'd take and pour the ice, that water out. And if someone forgot that? <laughs> uh <-huh. laughs> well, generally speaking, you didn't forget it. I mean, your parents would tell you, don't forget to get the ice, I mean, the ice water today. And another thing was the ice man always, when he would drive up, he would have, he'd have to chip the ice to get the, the weight. And he'd haul it in on his back. He had a, an insulated thing he'd wear on his back and he'd throw the ice across his back and bring it in and put it in your refrigerator. Well, 
those ice chips would fall in his truck and the kids would all gather around and eat the ice. Ice chips. I remember doing that too. Do you remember doing that? I sure do. And my dad delivered ice when he had his business in Martinsville. Mm -hmm. Um, Mr. Smitley, Everett Smitley was our ice man, I can remember. And he had the ice plant, as I recall, too, on North 5th Street, just north And the Smitley helped him, too, and Mr. Smitley helped him some. And Mr. Smitley helped him some. I can't remember what Smitley it was, because uh, he wasn't... Uh, was it a Cleo? No, I there was, was a Cleo Smelly. Yeah, there was a Cleo, but I don't think it was a Cleo. No. How has that, uh, I guess from today, looking back, how has that neighborhood changed where you grew up? I think neighborhoods then were friendlier than they are now, really. You neighbored with your neighbors. You. Um, helped them out. You maybe sat with them if they, if they, if anybody got sick, you would go and help them out. I think neighbors were friendlier then. Uh, people are more. Uh, uh, I don't know how to describe it, really. I think part of it maybe was just simply they're more sociable at that time than they are today. Uh, I mean, we kids say hello, we go by, outside but... more. Kids don't play outside mm -hmm. anymore. Uh, we didn't have the, uh, uh, well, we didn't have the toys then that they have now. <laughs> we had balls and bats, marbles. In fact, I still got the marbles. You can see that marbles is up there. Oh, yeah. I've got a jar about like that. Yeah, I got some in the bedroom too. I collected all those marbles. Um, my brother bought my first bicycle. He shined shoes at a barbershop uptown. He bought my first bike and he bought it at Western Auto. I remember that. Mr. Walker had Western Auto. You say that was your brother that bought the bicycle? Mm -hmm. Don. Okay. Don bought it. Yeah. It sounds like you had some, some fun, even though you may not have had a room full of toys like kids do to Oh, today. we had a lot of fun. We, we played outside. We played out at night. We played under the street lights at night. We had a lot of street lights, and uh, we used to play uh, Andy over. You didn't play that, wouldn't play that now, but you had, remember you used to take a ball and throw it over the house, mm -hmm. see, catch it, see where it went. And we used to play a lot of games. Uh, we, the kids would play a lot of games, blackjack uh, with the marbles, and they played um, uh, jump rope, and uh, I'm trying to think what some of the other games, but we had so many games to play. Uh, we played under the, just played games under the street light. Mm -hmm. Different games. Were those games also? And a lot of times we didn't do anything but visit. We sat on the sidewalk and visit and talk to each other. And I think that's part of the thing that people just don't do anymore. Even adults don't seem to visit much. And it seems like the younger generation is too busy on their cell phone, texting. They, they don't and, communicate with each and other. They sure don't. What, uh, what is something that you remember just so vividly about school? I think the different te the teachers were all different. I can remember all my teachers. I think I can too. You remember all your teachers? I think so. And some of the teachers were were uh, uh, very friendly, and um, you participated in a lot of things in the classroom. And then some teachers were more well. Especially our principal, who was Mrs. Ch Cora Church. I don't remember Cora Church. Maybe I've heard not. the name, but yeah. uh, Mrs. Cork was my first grade teacher. Is that Louise? Mm -hmm. My second grade. She was teacher. my first grade teacher. Was she your first grade mm -hmm. teacher? And my second grade teacher was Ruth Friedberg. Okay. And then my third grade teacher was Clara. 
and my fourth grade teacher was Mrs. Rutman. And uh, let's see, my fifth grade teacher was um, Mrs. Finkbeiner. As some of those teachers would go back and forth, I'm trying to think. Cora Church was also my eighth grade teacher. She was also my eighth grade teacher. And Wilma, uh, Mrs. Geisert was my seventh grade teacher. Remember Mrs. Geisert? Oh, yes. And she was my wife's favorite teacher in high she school. She was not. Well, <laughs> she taught, oh, was she? Yes, and she taught English, I believe, in high school. And of course, Elder became yeah. a, an English mm -hmm. teacher. Oh, yeah. So you had her as an elementary teacher then? Mm -hmm. Hmm. Yeah. But they um, were, um, all the teachers, uh, all the teachers were pretty good teachers, I thought. They, uh, they had pets. So. I mean, you knew who they really, my sister was one of the pets because she was tiny. She was, I don't know, Norma was just a little. And they all just kind of took a liking to Norma. And I was bossier, I guess. I was, I was bossy when I was in, uh, because I had to look after my sister. I mean, I looked after Norma because she's about a year younger than me. And uh, she was, uh, She's the one that seemed like had the fun, and I got the responsibility of taking care of her, watching it. She didn't get in any trouble, uh, you know. Well, you must have done the job then. I must have done the job. She. Could you have some uh, hobbies? I see you've got a few collections around. Oh yeah, there. I collect coins. I collected coins. Did this start as, as a youngster? Uh, when I was a youngster, I collected uh, just different. Uh, well, most of this stuff I collected when I got married. After I got married, and I need. To, I got so much cleaning to do. It's pathetic. Do you ever have a lot of cleaning to do and just don't get it done? Sure. So what are some of your collections? And you said coins? I got coins. I just gave uh, some gold coins to my girls. I gave them each a $25 gold piece. Oh, nice. Um, I went up to the Historical Society to see how much they were worth. And oh, one's worth $635. One was just, it's like 620 And, you know, it was just different to uh, most of them were early 1900s. But, you know, I don't remember where I got those coins. Um, I would say probably when the gold wasn't really talked about too, you know, wasn't given any special interest till now. And I get so I get so aggravated, though, because if you write in and ask about a coin, you get seven or eight letters from different. I'm getting so I don't do that anymore. I just, I don't do it anymore as much as I used to. I see you've got a wonderful pet in there today. As a youngster, as a child, did you have a pet? A pet? Yes, a dog, cat? Yes, I did. Jip. Jip. I jipper, jipper. And he was a doggy, and he followed me to school, <gasps> and he stayed at school till I come home, and then he come home with me. There was another thing I used to do. When I go to school in the spring, violets, there was a lot of violets. And uh, the big house that stands across from the playground there in the South School, um, there used to be a, a ditch and a field that was had a lot of violets. And we used to go early in the morning or to pick violets and bring them home to your mom. Did you take some to the teacher, too? Not too often. <laughs> <laughs> uh, some teachers I liked. I liked Pink, Mrs. Finkbeiner and Mrs. Cork. And Mrs. Claypool was different. She was just a different teacher. She never had any, fam any brothers or sisters, so I don't think she knew how to interact. And uh, then Mrs. Rutman, she was older. 
Rutman. Rutman. Her name was Rutman. She was, what did I, what did I tell you? She was my fourth grade teacher. Mm -hmm. Did I, did, did I put, did I give her, give her? No, I guess not. Uh, she, you know, I don't, I think she was, I don't think she ever married. I don't think so. And it's fake, I know she did. She was married, our sixth grade teacher. And, uh. But I'm trying, my fifth grade teacher, she, I'm trying to think what her name was. Did I put down the fifth grade teacher? I didn't write them by year. No, you didn't write them. Okay, all right, names. that's all right. Park that's and Fink right. Minor, yeah. Church and Geyser. Yeah, that's all right. Um, this lady was, uh, the reason I got, she, when she was, I was out of school then. No, it was, she ran over a little girl. Yeah. Well. It was like a mailbox on the side of the street, and she was a little girl ran across the front, and I just said she ran over. That was later, so <clears throat> later in life that I can remember her doing that. We look around this lovely kitchen, and you've got all kinds of conveniences today. How about comparing that to preparation of meals and stuff as uh, as a youngster? You mentioned the stove at the reservoir. I bet that was either wood or coal. It was coal. Started with wood. Started the stove with wood. And I had a coal stove. And we had a garage. And then the then you didn't have inside bathrooms either. Because you didn't have the sewers like you do now. And um, that wasn't fun either. <laughs> well, how about the preparation of food with that old coal stove? Preparation and, um, of food. Uh, Mom used to get up early in the morning and start to uh, get the stove going in the kitchen. And the reason she did was because Dad always had to get up and go to work. And uh, I think at the time Dad worked on the railroad, on the sh what they call the shops. Um, I think that was repairing. If I can remember, it seemed like that was repairing of uh, of equipment, and he was a he worked in the shops. Is that in Terre Haute? Yeah. Did he work? Mm -hmm. Yeah. And there used to be several of them go together. I can remember that. <clears throat> and then uh, he worked on several. He worked. He always worked. I remember he always had a job. He always he worked um, also. Um, uh, let's see. He worked as a, he was a policeman, I know, here in Marshall for a long time. And his name was? Ferris, Hubert Ferris. Hubert Buddy Ferris. Used to call him, they okay. called him Buddy. Mm -hmm. I couldn't remember his first name. Yeah. Well, nobody did. That was a funny name for a young, for a baby. Hubert. And that is F E R R I S, too. Huh? Ferris. F E R R R I S. Uh -huh. F E R R. So that's what I thought. Um, and he also worked uh, for the state as a waitman. He was a waitman out here at those scales years oh. after it, they started that. And uh, let's see what else did he do. He was a councilman up here too, and the mayor. David was council. Dad, dad was. And, and, you know, I was surprised the feeder got elected. I cannot believe that. He's such a troublemaker. I agree. <laughs> oh, my. Uh, as I recall, there was a, uh, a young man that you probably married that was kind of well known in this area and did a lot to help protect the public and all. John. Do you tell them about him? John Gagan. Yeah. Mm -hmm. I met John in high school. And uh, he went off to service. He went off to service when he was 17 years old. 33rd Field Hospital. Field Hospital, and he, I've got, uh, we had a higher retirement dinner for him, and um, he uh, came back, and um, Frank Gard 
bought John his Sam Brown and his gun. You remember Frank Gard? No, I, 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 get, I knew the name. He lived the country, he's a farmer. Yeah, I knew the name. And John used to help the farmers a lot because John, when John was 12 years old, he moved in with Frazier's. Hmm. Remember Garver, Garver Frazier's Garver. parents? Yeah. He was treated like their son, and he lived with them. And, uh, well, the reason that happened was that John's mother uh, had two children, and when her par she and her husband were separated, she went to work for a children's home in Paris, and they would only allow one child. So Gar Frazier said, well, that she could come live with them. So he lived with them, and they raised him, and he went from there to the service and come back and went back down there and we went with each other. Uh, he didn't graduate, but he did graduate from the, uh, later, he didn't, he didn't graduate from high school because he went right in service. <laughs> so you knew each other from way, way back then? We knew each other from uh, mostly just from high school. I didn't know him when he was that young, you know. And what year were you married then? We were married in 46, 1946. Well, I know he had a lot of following. A lot of people fought a great, great deal of uh, he, was, uh, he was a, he he was was a super, good person. Super guy. Yeah. He, was, he helped a lot of people out, and he helped a lot of people who maybe had a little bit too much to drink. And he didn't want to see him go to jail. And he would come home and change from his uniform into his clothes. So he wouldn't be considered an officer of the law, giving one person um, a little bit more help than another person. He's what I would call a people person. He was. Mm -hmm. And um, he helped a lot of people out. And they told me after he passed away, oh my gosh, you wouldn't realize what he did. No, I didn't, because he never said anything. <laughs> well, I know. Uh, <clears throat> and he loved construction. Really? I he worked uh, construction and drove caterpillars for Frank Dubeck. Oh, yeah, he was. Um, Did that uh, dovetail with his work with the state police, or uh, was that? That was extra. Extra, okay. That was just extra job. Was, they knew John liked it, and he learned it, and uh, he loved heavy equipment and trucks, and he liked that kind of stuff. Okay. So he would do that after he would, uh, uh, after he got off the state police, he got it. I remember one time you gave a program at the library. It was very, very interesting on your experience with a company called Belsico. Can you tell a little bit about, uh, about that here? <clears throat> Um, Belsco Corporation had been in Marshall for quite a while, and uh, <clears throat> during the war they ran short of people to work, and because a lot of the younger men, and all they had was older men working, and a lot of the younger men had gone to service, and they said they needed lab workers, and so I, my, my dad said, well, why don't you go apply, and I applied as a, in the lab, and Mr. McKenna was a chief chemist, and he taught me all about weights, measurements uh, in the lab. And I still remember a lot of the girls that worked up there. There was uh, from Marshall. There was Emmy Fritcher. Um, there would be um, <clears throat> Ann Lovett. It was Lovett's and Kyle. Um, let's see, I'm trying to think. Wanda Veach, she was from Martinsville. Yeah. Yeah. Teresa Connerton. Uh, Dorothy Howard, Dorothy Garwood. I think I worked out there probably longer than any of them. I got to be the chief lab tester, so I got to stay there. Who's the last one you mentioned, Dorothy? Howard, Howard. Dorothy Garwood. Dorothy Garwood. You remember yeah. Bob Garwood? Yeah, okay. Yeah. His sister. Okay. She and her brother were twins. 
Don, Don and Dorothy. So you're working primarily in the lab there then? I'm there in the lab and I used to go down to the, uh, well, to the yard, down, down to the railroad track where they had sample and give, pick up samples and bring it back. John Edwards worked out there. Uh, let's see, Leo Lettner worked out there. Of course, a lot of the men worked out there after I left. Uh, remember the Pruitt boy that got burned so bad? He, oh uh, yeah, Bellis Pruitt's husband. Did, uh, did did you continue with that job then for some period of time, or did after, the men come back from the army? Uh, then the war was over. Mm -hmm. The war was over. <clears throat> after well, after the war was over, why? Um, the men start coming back from service, and that's when John and I start going together, and we start going together in August and married in November. <laughs> so, in that work in the lab, did you ever feel, I guess, uneasy or that it was a dangerous place or anything no, of that nature? No, I, I didn't feel like it was dangerous at all. I. Uh, I felt like I knew what would blow up and what wouldn't blow up, so I was very, very careful. The only thing that blew I blew up was a can of um, <laughs> chicken noodle soup. In the lab? Uh -huh. <laughs> I put it on a hot plate, not realizing you have to put a hole in the can, <laughs> because otherwise they get combustion. Sure. And it blew noodles all over the ceiling. Oh my <laughs> gosh. <laughs> We, had, we girls were spent half the, half the evening picking up, cleaning up the noodles. <laughs> but other than that, we never, <coughs> never had any accents. We did have a lot of, uh, the guys used to torment the girls about, you know, would bring, the men would bring samples up from the la from down in the plant. And then we'd have to, we would have to test them, make sure that what they had was, was right for shipment. You know, you ship it out. So um, it was. I don't remember how much we made. I don't think we made a lot. I don't think they paid a lot of money then. Um, did after the noodle soup episode, did that put a curtailment on food in the lab? No. no? <laughs> we knew better than do anything. Try to get to try lighting um, anything or putting anything on a hot plate. I like that. Okay. Did uh, your period out there? Did you go from that then to another job in Mexico from the lab? Or? No. When I was probably sixth grader, I always wanted to be a nurse, and I wanted to be a nurse from the time. I mean, I can just remember. I say I want to be like Florence Nightingale, you know, and. So then what happened was that uh, during the war, there was shortage of mm -hmm. automobiles, shortage. They didn't, they used all the equipment, everything for for tanks, and you didn't, didn't have cars like you do now. So I didn't have any way to get to nursing school because it was in Terre Haute. So after... I guess it must have been back in 40, I'm trying to think how old I would have been. It was back in the late 60s, early 70s that I went to school. My Gina was nine, Gina the youngest child was nine, and I had a babysitter, Janet was babysitting, so I, I, there was, uh, I started going to school at Ivy Tech. And graduated um, with honors. Actually, I was surprised I didn't Ooh. graduate from high school with honors, but I graduated from. Uh, I loved. Uh, I loved nursing. So there was three of us got hired after we got graduated. I went on days. Uh, two girls, one from Sullivan and one from Clinton, and one went nights, one went evenings, and there was three of us hired. Now that Ivy Tech was the one in. Ivy in Tech South, uh -huh, yeah. uh -huh. Ivy Tech. So I graduated from there, and I, I did, I went to school for a year, and uh, got to be an LPN. So then I came, went to work at Union Hospital, and worked there for several years. 
I went to work there and, and then graduated from, <clears throat> or didn't graduate, but I mean, I quit working there. And uh, John got sick. <clears throat> John got sick, and I stayed home to take care of him. I took care of him. Well, your uh, nursing background then would be and, tremendous help. And then I went to work at, they called me and wanted to know if I could, would be able to come to work at Burnside. And I thought, oh, I don't know whether I want to work at Burnside. They said, well, it's just in the evenings, pass the meds to the people, and give them the med their medicines. And I said, well, I can do that. So my Charlie worked, uh, she and I took turns. She'd work three or four evenings, I'd work three or four evenings. I see her once in a while, not too often, but I want to know. So about how long did you work then at Burnside? Uh, I remember you being there. But... I worked there about five years. Okay. Mm -hmm. That's kind of an interesting, interesting background from blowing up uh, chicken soup to uh, <laughs> being in the nursing. Yeah. <laughs> Can you think back, all of the things that have happened and you've seen experiences of all kinds, is there something that just strikes in your mind as one of the outstanding events and something that might have even changed your life? I don't know whether it changed my life, <clears throat> but it was on a Sunday. I was listening to the radio because you had new television. My brother was in service, Don. He, he was on the USS, he was on the Mississippi Battleship. And I heard they bombed Pearl Harbor. I think that bombing Pearl Harbor, it did something to everybody, you know? I mean, they couldn't, it, it couldn't happen. It just wasn't something that could happen. <clears throat> and then that my mother seemed like she turned gray overnight because my brother, we didn't know where he was. Come to find out, he had been, the ship was in the, uh, it was, it was in the Pacific. Oh. And so it got, went to the Atlantic and went north into the Atlantic, and everything was silent, and we didn't know that until <clears throat> he told us later, every, all the ships. My goodness, it was fortunate then that they had left the harbor. Mm -hmm. They had left, they had left out there, and my mother just didn't know where he was. Mm. And finally, I got, I got a letter in there from him, and it was, <clears throat> it, say, it stated then that, um, they had uh, uh, silenced everything, and sure. had, yeah, and a lot of the ships had gone into the Atlantic. Have you, by any chance, had an opportunity to visit the Pearl Harbor Memorial? Yes, I have. I thought you had. Yeah, been there. That's quite an emotional. Oh yeah, place it's to there, visit. and and go out on that ship, and to know all those young mm -hmm. men. Are they are. In that ship, mm -hmm. it just makes you sick. It does, you know. And uh, even even now, you see a little bit of bubble of oil on that harbor. Yes, there too. You've been yes. There too. yeah. As well, I say, it's an emotional. It's an emotional. I've been a lot of places that I didn't realize I've been to Machu Picchu. Have you been to Machu Picchu? Yes, fascinating place. Oh yeah, <laughs> and the Incas and all the uh, all the monasteries there and. Uh, how the Spanish Quescadores killed all the Indians, how they... They weren't necessarily nice guys, were they? No, they weren't. It seemed like the main thing they were after was gold, or riches or yeah, something. Yeah, yeah. And I uh, went to Hawaii. Let's see where else. I've been, I've been to several places. Of course, I've been there locally. I've been locally. I've been in all the places. But um, not j and I've been to Ireland. Had been to Ireland. Isn't that beautiful? Oh, I love it. I love it. Oh, uh, yeah. And Janice married. Here comes David. <laughs> Hi there. Hello. And uh, and uh, we went to Ireland for a reunion. Oh. And while we were in reunion, Janice <laughs> met a man, and she married him two years ago. His mm -hmm. name's Vince. And would you believe his name's Gagan? Oh, that usually doesn't happen. No, no, no. And uh, 
So she works. Uh, she works right now. She's in Mississippi. She travels a lot. She works in Chicago and Mississippi, and the girls are all over. I mean, none of them are out local. I love geography. Yeah. Oh yeah, I do too. Mark, would you say there was a uh, modern convenience somewhere in your house, or that you own, that's made a big change in your life? I would say the modern convenience in my house that made the biggest probably uh, was a refrigerator. I don't know if anyone else would think that would be, but you know that's something that saves a lot of, of your food. And. Um, Now, stove, I'm not as, that doesn't make that much difference to me. It seems like most people I ask that question to, but they come up with the, the TV set. TV. But I could live without a TV, but I many could people couldn't. I could live with radio. I like radio. Oh, yeah. I don't listen to it much. I don't, I have a radio. I turn the radio on and go to bed at night. And when, I'm, when I wake up in the morning, it's on. And then they they give you the weather, but they were talking about what severe weather they had north here last night and early this morning in I the Danville that. area. I did not hear that. We didn't have TV or radio on. Oh, you didn't. Well, that was on radio, and it said we might get that tonight or tomorrow. <clears throat> so. So you'd say then probably radio might be a big significant thing, right? Under refrigerator and then that radio. was one thing when I was a kid we did have we had a little radio. <clears throat> it was a zenith. Uh huh. And I can remember the first television we had. We had a television on North Fifth Street, and it was fifteen inch. It was a little big box, big huge box. Not a big little screen. <laughs> so. Um, other than that, no, I don't think so. There's a lot of things that um, have changed since I was a kid, you know, as far as uh, everything was manual. Now it's electric push buttons. buttons. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Don't you think so? I think so, too. And I'm not sure it's all for the best. Uh, no. I don't think so. It don't take as long uh, for some things, uh, even food. I mean, you know, you uh, you can buy you know, microwave probably. Microwave, yeah, they're different. <laughs> yeah, it's different. I like a microwave. I really do. Mm -hmm. I probably use microwave more than anything. So many people too talk about the washer and the dryer of being such a big convenience. You mentioned hanging the clothes in the bed or the dining room and all. And uh, many people say, oh my goodness, that dryer is just such a big convenience. But you still got your clothes dry. You Guess still, um, I mean, uh, you can always hang them on the line. Sure. And some people still do. And some people do. And my, uh, my daughter's daughter, who she lives in Georgia, her husband's in the Navy. Anyway, she doesn't want her mother to hang anything on the line. It looks really... There are some communities that have ordinances against hanging clothes on the outside line. But you know that helped in the winter time because you got humidity in the house. And the I mean, you didn't realize that then, oh, no. but now. And the wind whipping them, they were fresh, they were soft, and <coughs> the sunshine gave a new life to the fabrics. Oh, I know. I can remember when a doctor come to your house, sometimes you'd go out and sit in the swing and he'd, he'd look at you and examine you and everything. And then if you got a, but were vaccinated, <laughs> that's, he'd vaccinate you on the porch. Mm -hmm. I mean, you know, it just wasn't, you never went to the doctor. I mean, if you went to the doctor at the hospital, you went to die. Really? I mean, uh, most people thought if you if you ended up in the hospital, Bad news. that was it. Mm -hmm. That was the end. And for a lot of people, it was the end. 
Chloe, are you tired of us talking? Huh? She was a good girl. Chloe, Chloe, can you tell him what a good girl you are? Hmm? Can you? Oh, you're such a cutie. Oh, I could just put you in my pocket. Oh, she's a good Barb, if you were living in, or went to some other part of the country, maybe you met someone down at Machu Picchu or in Ireland, and you were trying to tell them about Marshall, what would be some of the things you would say to them? The first thing that comes to mind when you think of Marshall is a small town. It's a small town. I don't know what the population is now, but when I was growing up, it was between 28 and 3,000. They've got 4,000 on the sign now. Have yeah, they got 4,000? Uh -huh. And I don't know whether that, uh, then that was adults. You know, I don't think they counted kids at all. Then. But if I were to describe Marshall, um, I don't know what we have. Most everything, as far as commercially, we don't we don't do it here. A lot of commercial stuff we do some, but we don't do a lot of stuff. I mean, we can buy food. We got two grocery stores. Actually, if you want to call them grocery, the IGA and Walmart. Mm -hmm. Now we got the dollar store, but that don't that's that don't sell anything. Produce you know. or meat. And when I was growing up, there was. Four or five or more. So a lot of community or uh, there was neighborhood stores. Neighborhood store and neighborhood mm -hmm. grocery store. Yeah. So, um, no, I don't. I can't think of anything that I would just really want to. Would you say that was a good place to live? I think Marshall's changed a lot over a period of time. It's changed. Uh, I I don't think people are as friendly now as they used to be when I was a kid. But that was because you, uh, when you were younger, you didn't have the facilities to. Uh, you didn't have phones. We didn't have telephones. And if you, everything was by word of mouth. And. Um, I think people were friendlier then than they are now. I don't. You you see people you know, but there's a lot of people you don't know. And when you go to town the fall festival, I don't know where those people come from. I mean, I really don't, because I don't know where they come from. West Terre Haute, where they come from, Terrell, where they come from. You there know, are a lot of outside people from outside of town yeah. that do visit the festival. Yeah, there is. They come to see the festival. So, um, but there are people who are in charge and doing things now that I don't never even heard of. I don't know who they are. Well, before you really were into talking about this, you mentioned about uh, especially during the, I think primarily the '30s and '40s, people just did not have cars. No. Was that primarily because of, number one, there weren't very many cars manufactured, the price of them, and then it's hard to get gas? And most of it had to do, and if you had a car, most of the people who did, so there was a lot of people that had cars, but they were in a garage. They were in a garage. And um, I think that if it was anything happened to them, there wasn't anybody to really work on them too much. And uh, they didn't have, um, the only place you could have it worked on was with the dealership, and there was Chevrolet, Ford, Pontiac. There was a Hudson dealer, Clatfellers, Hudson. Clatfellers, and that was on the west side. West side. Mm -hmm. Yeah. And the Studebaker, also, Stanfield, that mm -hmm. Studebaker. Yeah, they had that later, yeah. But Bob, I remember too, though, especially in traveling, if you did have some minor car problems, usually you could pull into a gas station and there would be someone in there that knew how to get the hood up and what he was looking at under it anymore. These young people, there's no one even to look at the car and I don't think they even know how to get the hood up. Well, and another thing about it, when you had a car, you'd drive into a gas station and there'd be somebody put gas in your car, clean off your windshield, 
uh, if there was anything that maybe wiped the dirt off of the lights, you know. We don't have anybody to service anything anymore, but you're still charged a big price. I can remember gas was like nine cents, but even nine cents was a lot of money. I mean, I don't think people made a lot of money. I think 10, 20 cents an hour, I don't know. They didn't make a dollar or two an hour. You could go into the gas station and say a dollar's worth of gas, and it'd get you a little ways. Yes, it would. Barbara, it's been a real delight visiting well, you this Well, I don't know whether morning. I build you. And I think this is exactly the kind of thing that people in the future, this is going to be in the library, and it will be available to people to look at. Someone's going to say, gee, I didn't know that. Or yeah. find some interesting things. Um, it's been a delight talking to you, and I really appreciate so much I think you think about it, you think, boy, am I old, but I can go back and think of all that stuff that I Wow. That's changed since I was a little girl. And that's part of, I guess, time marching on. Another thing I want to tell you, I never had bought the clothes. My mother made our clothes. She even made our coats. And our winter coats were sometimes made from your dad's heavy coats. That he'd get a new coat, she'd take the old coat. Recycle. <laughs> cut it up and make us a winter coat. And sometimes they were so heavy you couldn't hardly walk. <laughs> Kept you warm, though, didn't it? <laughs> Kept you warm, yeah. Because we walked. You know where the method, you know where the UB church is? Mm -hmm. Go down that about three blocks. Yeah. It's on the corner. Still sitting there, that house is. And we walked from there to high school every day. That'd be a good long walk. That's a long walk. Mm -hmm. You'd start early, but then it was a long walk, especially in the winter. As I say, Barbara, it's just been a real delight, and I thank you so much for taking your time out this morning to visit with us and adding a little bit to our 